And a very pleasant good morning and welcome to the WGTD Radio Theater. This morning we present the Cedar Chest Letters and we're broadcasting live from the Racine, Wisconsin campus of Gateway Technical College. When Racine resident and longtime member of the 91.1 Players, Barbara Tyla, found a packet of old letters in her mother's Cedar Chest, she knew she had something special. In telling her family story, Barb offers a view of our shared heritage. Despite the challenges of the Great Depression and the early days of World War II, love conquers all in this charming play based on the letters her family left behind. The Cedar Chest Letters was written by Barb Tyla and stars members of the award-winning 91.1 Players. Support for the WGTD Radio Theater comes from the Kenosha Law Firm of Aaliyah, Dumay, and McTurnan. Also supporting the WGTD Radio Theater is the not-for-profit Brown Ostrup Performing Arts Foundation located in Salem, Wisconsin. And now, the Cedar Chest Letters. Good morning. You know what a cedar chest is, don't you? Hope chest, they used to call them. My parents had one. I believe mom kept her blankets in it and sweaters just ordinary things, nothing special, nothing of value, until one day after her death I opened it. There were over 60 letters in that box, all addressed to my mother. They ran from 1932 to 1943, which means they took in part of the Depression and the Second World War. As a history buff, this excited me. But these are not just my letters. They could belong to you, too. They might have come out of your cedar chest. So, this morning, let's pretend that they do. Let's pretend we are all members of that same family. We've crept upstairs to the attic, and we're sitting around our mother's cedar chest, reading letters from the past. It's about time we get this started. I was on my third time reading my paper. Oh, Will, it's not that bad. <laughs> Don't mind him, he's a little out of sorts. I'm not out of sorts. I did want to see the sports page, but not three times. Oh, hello there, Henrietta. You're here too? My, you look nice. Thank you, Daddy. So do you. Hi, hello, everyone. Dear. Hi, Daddy. <laughs> awesome. nice to see Hi, Mom. What's that you're reading, Henrietta? It's a book of poetry. They're by Edna St. Vincent Millay. Oh, I love Millay. My candle burns on both ends. It will not last the night. But all oh, my foes and all oh, my friends, it gives a lovely light. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's better. Let's see. Great Grandma Boyden, why don't we start with you? Me? Oh dear, why me? <laughs> because the best place to start is at the beginning. And you're the beginning of the story, aren't you? Well, what do you want me to do? Pick a letter from the box. The stage is yours. Well, that's easy enough. Oh, let's see. It says this letter was written in 1932. Oh, yes. My husband and I were retired then. For many years, we owned a farm and a general store in Mill Center, Wisconsin. The store was a good little business, but when Albridge turned 80, he decided to sell. Good thing, too. When the stock market crashed, we were okay. We had the farm so we could grow our own food, and we were able to keep the wolf from the door, so to speak. Oh, that was a bad time, I can tell you. Three years into the Depression, and everyone was feeling the pinch. My granddaughter, Henrietta, I call her girly, hated the name Henrietta, always did. But anyway, 
Gurley was one of the lucky ones. She had a job. She was teaching kindergarten in Algoma, Wisconsin, a little town across the bay. Well, she wasn't married then. She wouldn't meet Richard until the summer of 32. Back in February, she was just a young girl living on her own, trying to get through the winter as best she could. Dear Grandma, it's late, and everyone has gone to bed but me. I stayed downstairs because I wanted to write you a letter, and it's warmer in the parlor than it is in my room. You asked me in your last letter if I was happy in my work. The answer is yes. I love teaching kindergarten. The children are so sweet and unspoiled. I love every minute with them. No, my job is not the problem. Well, then what is, girly? Men. They're driving me crazy. <laughs> I see. Anyone in particular? No, that's the problem. Grandma, I'm 23 years old and there are no men in my life and no prospects. <laughs> as bad as that. <laughs> Don't laugh. It's serious. Some of the girls I know have had one, two, even three boyfriends and I haven't even had one steady beau. I go out on dates, but most of the time I can't wait until the evening is over. I'm bored to tears. What's wrong with me, Grandma? Oh, nothing, my dear. You just haven't found someone you liked. Come here. Sit down. Let me brush your hair. You're getting all worked up over nothing. We haven't done this for a long time. You used to brush my hair every night when I spent the summers here. Remember? I had to. Your hair was full of hay and nettles. <laughs> but you always straightened it out. No matter how bad it was tangled, you always straightened it out. Mmm, that feels good. Do you know what I liked best about those summers? Well, let me see. Playing in the hayloft? Feeding the lambs? Yes, that was fun. But I was thinking of something else. Bill loved being with Grandpa, and that was fine with me. It was the one time I was glad I had a brother instead of a sister. Mm -hmm. It meant I had you all to myself, unless the other cousins came out to the farm. Good Lord, and then everything was a free-for-all, wasn't it? Oh, yes. You'd give us all ice cream, and we'd go upstairs to the loft above the store, and we'd spend the afternoons telling ghost stories and fairy tales. Sometimes we'd even find costumes and act out the stories on the stage. Ah, yes, those were good times. I often think of them, girly. They were wonderful times, Grandma. And sometimes, sometimes, I wish I could go back. When I was little, I didn't have to worry about anything except burrs in my hair and whether or not my stockings were straight. Mm. Life is so complicated now. Well, childhood is fun. <laughs> but we can't be Peter Pans forever. Oh, well, I don't want to be a Peter Pan, but I would like to be a Wendy. At least she had a bow. Ah, but if you remember, she gave him up for the real world in the end. I know, but at least she had a choice. <laughs> Lordy sakes, girl, you're 23 years old. You've got a world of choices ahead of you. But one thing for sure is you'll never get to make them if you sit in your room writing letters to your grandmother. You're beautiful, smart, and fun. Mm. Some young man is just waiting for you to pull him out of the pond. Do you think so? I know so. There. That looks nice. Feel better? Mm. Yes, thanks. That feels wonderful. I think I can go to sleep now. Grandma, when you met Grandpa, how did you know he was the one? Did you know right away, or did it take a while? Well, let's see. I met him at church and liked him right off. He was a good-looking boy, but mm. a little bit shy. He hadn't gone past the fifth grade in school. And I think the fact that I was a teacher put him off some. Then how did you ever get together? Mm -hmm. Well, he sang in the choir, so I joined it, and the director put us next to each other. It took three weeks, but he finally asked me out. Mm. A month later, we were engaged. He was slow out of the gate, but he found his pace fast. We were married the following year. That's a wonderful story, Grandma. <laughs> yes. It turned out all right. We've had a good life. And I think marriage is the way to go for most people. But the worst thing a woman can do is settle for marriage just because she thinks she has to. Really? Really. Now, I don't believe in love at first sight. That first rush of passion always fades with time. 
But if you but you have to have some fire in the beginning if you want to enjoy some embers oh. at the end. Is that what Grandpa and you are doing now? Enjoying the embers? <laughs> Land's <laughs> sakes, child, no. <laughs> We've slowed to a waltz, maybe, but we're still dancing in the fire. Mother, really? Fire? Embers dancing? This is my letter, Jesse, not yours. It's time to close now, girlie. It's getting late. You'd best get on to bed. You've got school tomorrow. I will, Grandma. Thanks. And you know what? There's a dance at the Masonic Hall next Saturday. Some of the girls are going. Maybe I'll go with them. Ah, seek and ye shall find. <laughs> I thought you might need this quilt from the cedar chest tonight, dear. It's going to get cold. This is the quilt I made the summer I was 14. I've forgotten all about it. Your first and last quilt. (laughs) Mine, too, as I remember. I'll put it on our bed right now. Thank you for finding it. I didn't. You did. Yes, well, thank you anyway. Thank me for what? Oh, nothing, dear. I was just talking to myself. Look, look what I found in the cedar chest. Is this a trick question? It looks like a quilt. Oh, it is a quilt. Mother and I made it the summer Grace got married and moved away. Oh, what a time we had. If you want to learn the art of patience, try making a quilt sometime. (laughs) I think I'll pass. My patience is tried enough in the store. Is that Henrietta's letter? Yes, I was just going to read it again. Come sit with me. And what's happening in the world with our daughter this week? Let's see. She went to a dance last Saturday. A dance? Hmm, good. That's a start. Yes. And she met a young man there, another teacher. She says he seemed very nice. Hmm. I gather I shouldn't get my tux out of storage just yet. The key word is seemed. Yes, unfortunately. He took her home from the dance and he got a little forward. They ended up saying a few words and he left. He accused her of not being modern, whatever that means. (laughs) I can guess what it means. Good for our girl for putting him in his place. If he's worth anything, he'll come back and apologize. If not, then good riddance. When I write her tonight, I'll tell her. Yes, and leave room for me to add a note. You're done early. It isn't nine o'clock yet. Have you closed up the store already? No, but Harry's still here. He's playing the pinball machine, but he said he'd call me if anyone comes in. I wanted to come back and check on my girl, see how she's doing. Your girl is doing just fine. I feel much better. You worry too much. I'm not worried. But you did have that dizzy spell at dinner. For goodness sakes, Will. I've had the flu for a week. I'm entitled to be a little dizzy my first time up. Of course. I just don't want you to do too much too soon. An extra day resting won't kill you. It might. Sure isn't doing my blood pressure any good. I hate to lay around. There are things I have to do. The apartment is a mess, and you're all alone in the store. Will said he could help me out this weekend. In the meantime, I've got Harry Harry Conant isn't our son or our employee. He's a friend. So? Since when do we ban friends from helping? Harry was tickled when I asked him. Well, of course he's tickled. He can play the pinball machine all day Saturday. How many nights has he been in this week? Three. Three. And how much has he lost? Well, let's see. Uh, He dropped $8 on Monday, but he won 5 on Tuesday, so he felt better about coming in tonight. How's he doing so far? Last count, he was up a dollar. But that still puts us ahead of the week, so honestly, Jess, that machine is the only thin thing that's bringing in money for us. Harry's not the only player, you know. I know, but we wouldn't have to count on it if you didn't let our customers pay us with goods instead of money. We can't pay our bills with Mrs. Hovde's quince jam. How do we know? It might have good trade value. <laughs> There's another good thing about the pinball machine. It has neither compassion nor conscience. Anyone can play as long as they keep feeding it nickels. Elizabeth thinks you're leading Harry to hell with that machine. (laughs) Harry doesn't need any leading. He can find his way there by himself. I know, but Elizabeth thinks you shouldn't make it so easy. I'm not, but she wouldn't believe me. She thinks I'm headed there already. Well, what do you think? About what? Do you think the devil's got a finger on me too, counting his days until he can pull me into the fire along with poor Harry Conant? I think you're the last person the devil has a finger on. I'm not sure about Harry. Well, I am. And Harry is no more a contender for Hades than I am. He likes to play the pinball machine, so what? If that's his only vice, it's a small one. You don't have to convince me. Talk to Elizabeth. I like games of chance, now and then. Speaking of games, you owe me a cribbage game. You skunked me last time out, so care for a rematch? 
Oh, Will, I don't think so, not tonight. I'm sorry, I, I guess the day has caught up with me finally. Do you mind? No, if it's only the day that's caught up with you. You're sure you're not feeling lightheaded again? No, I feel fine. I'm just tired. And get your hand off my forehead. I don't have a fever. Honestly, being married to a pharmacist is almost as bad as being married to a doctor. You're both always looking for trouble. Now go chase Harry out and close up the store. I'm going to bed. Come when you're ready. I will. I want to write Henrietta first. Good night. Good night, dear. My grandfather was a kind and gentle man, compassionate to a fault. During the Depression, he carried many of his customers on his own back. That made him many friends, but not much money. He struggled daily just to make ends meet. I can only imagine how painful it was to have to ask my mother for help. Dear Henrietta, can you give me a loan of $15 for 10 days? I have some drugs at the depot which I would like to pick up Saturday. Mother's new high blood pressure medicine is included in this lot. I sure hope it makes a difference. She makes light of her dizzy spells, but Dr. Netto is concerned and so am I. I kind of thought you would have come home last Saturday. I would have driven you back on Sunday, or rather I would have let you do the driving. Last week, coming back from Green Bay, I got lost. <laughs> Mother and I were talking and I took a wrong turn. We went five miles on the wrong road before I realized what I had done. No harm. We got home all right and enjoyed the drive very much. Wish you could have been with us. With love, Dad. Dear Dad, enclosed is the $15 you requested. I wish I could send more, but I'm afraid I'm a little short this month. Maybe I can come home next weekend. I'd like to see both you and Mother. Of course, it depends on the weather. If I take the bus into Green Bay, could you pick me up there? Maybe we can get lost on the way back. That sounded like fun. Remember the drives we used to take on Sundays in the fall? Mother used to hate it when you brought your shotgun. You said you wanted to be prepared in case we ran into a partridge or a quail. Ran into his right. The only partridge your father got, he didn't even shoot. <laughs> Hurry on, Jess. Get in the car. The rain stopped. It'll be a nice ride now to Algoma. I don't know why you want to leave this early. Reverend Howard is going to wonder why we're not at church services. He won't wonder why I'm not at church. <laughs> he knows I only come at Christmas and Easter. He thinks I'm a heathen. Oh, he knows you're not a heathen. He thinks you're a little misguided, that's all. He still has hopes for you. Well, tell him not to get them up too high. My talks with the Lord are done better in the woods than sitting on a hard bench at church. But what about me? Well, I'm perfectly happy to let you sit on a hard bench at church. Huh. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I draw the line at this. I am not sitting in the front seat with this gun. It's in a case. It's not going to go off. I don't care. I don't want to share my seat with the gun. Either it goes into the back seat or I do. Hmm. You drive a hard bargain, Jesse Holtz. Nevertheless, that's my only offer. Well, then I guess I'll have to concede the front seat to my wife. She's a lot prettier anyway. There, we're off. Don't drive past the church. I don't want anyone to see me. Us. Oh, too late. Good morning. Nice day. Say hi to the reverend oh, for us. Oh, what's that? I don't know. Never saw them before. <laughs> Will Holtz, you are incorrigible. What am I going to do with you? Hopefully nothing. I, <laughs> I like what you've been doing for the last 30 years, so I changed the recipe. Now don't try to sweet talk me. I'm still miffed. We've always waited until after church before we went to see Henrietta. Why today are we leaving at the crack of dawn? 7 a.m. is not the crack of dawn. You know what I mean. Because today's the last day of partridge season, and Harry Conant has bagged three this year, and I haven't even had a sighting. But that's all going to change today. It is. How? You can't shoot a bird that isn't there. Even Harry will agree to that. Yes, but Harry didn't get the tip I did. Sam Willard picked up his sulfa prescription for Ada yesterday, and he wanted me to charge him. Oh, not again. Well, look out. The car's going to turn. Hey, watch it! Why don't you give a fellow a warning? He did. 
He signaled. You just weren't watching. Anyway, what about Sam? Well, I told him he could charge half, and I'd let the other half go if he'd give me a tip for getting a partridge. Oh, Will. It's the last time I'll let him charge, and I told him so. I'll believe that when I see it. So, what's his grand tip he gave you? Well, he says that since we're going to Algoma today, all we need to do is go a couple of miles west, and I'll get my partridge. He guarantees this. How do you guarantee what a bird is going to do? He says that there's a big cornfield on the other side of Ocanto Falls where the birds gather every morning and evening. He says I can't miss. Either I'll get a bird on the way to Algoma, or I'll get it on the way back. <laughs> my luck is changing today, little lady. You just watch. I'm watching. So, what does a partridge look like? Well, a little like a pheasant, only smaller. It, it has kind of a fantail. Does it have a little beak, and is it brown and speckled? Yes, and you keep an eye out for it now, and you let me know when you spot one. I did. You did what? Spot one. When? Just now, back there. Uh, why didn't you tell me? I did just now. Look, you can see it. It's still there, sitting on my side of the road. <laughs> well, I can't back up. I'll scare it away. Why don't you get your gun? Maybe you can sneak up on it. You can't sneak up on Partridge. They're a very skittish bird. Then how do you get them? If you have a dog, they scare them up into the air and you shoot them. Well, we don't have a dog. No, but this may work anyway. <clears throat> Dang it anyway, I, I can't reach my gun. You'll have to get out of the car. Hurry, it's starting to walk across the road. If you'd have let me keep this in the front seat, it would have been so easy. But no, my wife wants to ride shotgun without the gun. I'm sorry. Well, no harm done. Yet. Where is it now? Gone. Gone? It flew away while you were getting your gun. Oh. I'm sorry. Maybe we'll find another one. Maybe. Now that I know what I'm looking for, it'll be easier. You'll see. You said your luck was going to change, and I feel it. I really do. People make their own luck anyway. That's what Mother says. Remember that man from the Bay? He went out west to start a ranch. Where'd he go? Wyoming? South Dakota? Something. I forget. Anyway, he made a fizzle of the ranch, so he came back to the Bay, and then they discovered oil on his land out west. The oil company wanted him to sell the property, but he didn't. He leased it out instead, and now he's one of the richest men in the state. Now, some would say that it was just blind luck, but I don't think it was. If he hadn't gone out west and bought the land in the first place... Oh, look. There's a whole flock of them. Look out, Will. You're going to hit them. Slowly and quietly get out of the car. What? Shh. Slowly and quietly get out of the car. Oh, okay. Oh, my... What is it? What's wrong? Remember what I said about blind luck? Yes. Well, I believe it now. Holy Hades. What was that story about the brave little tailor? He got seven flies with one blow? <laughs> we did better than that. We got three partridge with one bumper. <laughs> <laughs> Some would say my grandfather was not successful. He ran a business which barely kept its head above water, and he worked six days a week to do it. Yet he and my grandmother were two of the happiest people I've ever known. My mother measured most of the men she met against my grandfather, which is why they always fell a little bit short. Until the summer of 1932, the year she met my father. Dear Grandma, you asked about the young man I've been seeing. His name is Richard Thomas Medlin, and he is a journalism student at the University of Toledo in Ohio. He's very cute and smart, and I like him a lot, although I'm afraid the relationship won't go very far because he's only here for the summer. Did you know that there is a nasty little beetle called a corn borer? Evidently, Michigan's crop is full of them, and Wisconsin doesn't want the bug to get into our state, so they started this unit called the Core Bore Patrol. It's made up of college boys, and my Richard is one of the patrolmen. 
Dick's job is to stand on the Menominee Bridge and check the cars going from Michigan into Wisconsin to make sure they're not transporting corn. It's an easy job, he says, and the pay is good. He also says he likes the fringe benefits, meaning me, of course. We've been seeing a lot of each other, and do you know what, Grandma? When I'm with him, I never check the clock. I'm having too much fun. Love, your little girly, Henrietta. When fall came, my dad had to return to Ohio, but before he left, he proposed to my mother and gave her a small engagement ring. Being engaged was exciting. Being separated, however, was not. And my father, ordinarily a patient man, grew impatient. Dear Grandma, I am in a quandary. As you know, Dick and I are engaged, but we agreed before he went back home, that marriage was out of the question now. He was in, he had school to finish and parents and siblings he is helping to support. And I'm in the same predicament. I thought we were in total agreement about waiting and now suddenly he's changed his mind. He wants us to run away and get married. I see. And why the sudden change of heart? Well, it, uh, it's personal. I'd rather not say. I see. Do you want me to guess what the reason is? It just seems so silly talking about it. Nothing is silly if it's keeping you up at night. Well, you know, I've met Dick a couple of times after he went home. Once in Toledo before school started when I stayed with his family. And once in Thanksgiving weekend when we met in Chicago. Oh, I know. Your mother told me you stayed at the home of one of his relatives? Mm -hmm. His Aunt Lou and Uncle Jim. They own a boarding house in Chicago. It's a big house with lots of rooms, but all of them were occupied when we were there. Well, they weren't all in use. She had one room that was vacant, but of course she wasn't going to let us have it, at least not together. So Aunt Lou gave the room to Dick and his Uncle Jim, and I ended up sleeping with her. I gather the arrangement didn't work out uh, too well? Well, at first we laughed about it, but as the weekend went on, it wasn't so funny. They wouldn't let us have one minute (sighs) alone. We couldn't even talk outside on the porch without one of them glaring at us through the window. When Dick took me to the train station on Sunday, he said this was the last weekend we were going to spend like this. Either we got married or he didn't want us to meet anymore. And what did you say to that? I told him he was being silly. People don't just up and get married for reasons like that, do they? And besides, I couldn't get married anyway. Women teachers aren't allowed to marry. It's in the contract. Is Dick saying you should quit your job then? No, he's not saying that. He says I should keep on teaching, at least until he finishes school and can get a job to support us. That's not the point. Then what is, my dear? So far, I don't see any problem. Just a whole lot of excuses. The point is, Grandma, that if I get married, I'll have to quit my job. That's the rule. Posh! It's a silly rule. I've always said so. Nevertheless, it is a rule, and I have to obey it, don't Uh, I? Not as far as I'm concerned. Whether a woman is married has no bearing on her ability to teach. Let me ask you one thing. Do you love Dick? Yes, of course I do. And does he love you? He says he does. Then that's the only thing that matters. Oh, my dear little girlie. A year ago, you were crying that you had no choices. Now it appears that you do. Do you marry the man you love? Or do you let him go for the sake of a silly rule that the state will rescind in a year? Yes, but what if they don't? Then in the meantime, what they don't know won't hurt them. Mother, you didn't tell him that. Oh, don't get your skirts twisted into a knot, Jessie. It's nothing you wouldn't have told her yourself. 
My mother took Grandma Boyden's advice. She and my father eloped to Crown Point, Indiana in February of 1933. They continued a long-distance marriage for two years until Dad found a job with an insurance company and Mother was able to join him in Ohio. There is no death notice for Grandma Boyden in any of the Cedar Chest letters, only a small letter from an attorney in Green Bay. The letter is dated January 7, 1936. It states simply that my mother was mentioned in the will and was to receive $500 in cash from the estate of Henrietta Boyden. $500 was a considerable sum of money back then. It must have been very welcome to my parents who were thinking about starting a family. But while money may have helped to raise a family, it is useless in the process of starting one. In the spring of that year, my father came down with the mumps. It was a bad attack, and afterwards the doctor gave him the grim news. In all probability, he was sterile. There is no letter describing the effect the news had on my parents, I'm sure it must have been disheartening, but a letter from my grandmother the following year reveals that the medical profession is not infallible. Dear Henrietta and Dick, what a wonderful Christmas announcement you gave us. We are as thrilled about the baby as you are. Just keep in close touch with your doctor and everything will be all right. I wish I could be near to help you. The methods are so different these days than when my babies came, and I may be a little old-fashioned, but I believe the general care is the same. Isn't it a wonderful coincidence that your letter came just before we left to see the nativity play at church? At this time of year, the whole world is full of hope, and a baby is the reason for it all. What you said about the double room might be all right, but I wouldn't consider a ward. You'll never get any rest. The price seems high, but of course if the doctor is a specialist, I suppose that accounts for it. I'll be anxious to know about everything, so keep me posted, and I'll help you any way that I can. (laughs) We laughed when we read what Dick said about the mums. I guess he showed everyone, didn't he? Lots of love, Mother. We now jump a few years to March of 1941. We are nine months away from entering World War II, although, of course, no one realizes this. We've only read about the war in Europe, in the newspapers, and while it is horrifying to hear about the 2,000 Jews who died of starvation in the Warsaw Ghetto, or of the fighting between England and Germany and Africa, President Roosevelt has signed the Lend-Least Act to give aid to our allies, so we feel we are helping at least. In Marinette, Wisconsin, Grandpa Holtz writes to my mother of more personal worries. Dear Henrietta and Dick, While Mother is resting, I will try to get a letter written. Mother is feeling better today. She had a gallbladder attack last week, but she's been doing much better now. She worries about the store, and I try to keep her spirits up, but... It's a losing proposition no matter how you look at it. I'd like to take your advice and sell it and move to Toledo. As a licensed pharmacist, I know I could get work, but selling the store would be next to impossible Well, at this time. Nobody has any money and I just couldn't up and leave it. Maybe if the country does a turnaround and people start investing again, selling might be an option. But until then, I guess we'll just have to keep plugging along. I laughed when Mother read me your last letter. So Barbara still talks about me falling into the lake last summer. That was a real vaudeville act, wasn't it? I wonder if she remembers how we pretended to cook stones and eat them. Well, Mother is stirring, so I guess I'll have to close. Write soon and and pray that this depression ends so we can all get back to our lives. Love, Dad. 
The next letter is from my mother. It is dated November 7th, 1941. We are a month away from the attack on Pearl Harbor, but no one is concerned about us getting into the war. My mother certainly isn't. Her mind is fastened on Christmas and the fact that her parents might come to Toledo for the holiday. Dear Mother and Dad, I can hardly believe that you and Dad might come here for Christmas. My head is spinning with the news, and Barbara is so excited. She chatters all day long about making stone soup and having Nana and Grandpa here to see her open her presents. It would be nice if you could stay for at least a week, but I know that is probably too much to ask for. Dad will be chomping at the bit if he's away from the store for too long, even if he's got someone to watch it. I'm going to do my grocery shopping before you come, so get your orders in for anything special. I don't intend to step into any food market once you are here, unless it's absolutely necessary. Do you realize we've been in Toledo for five years, and this is the first time you've come for a visit? I want to spend every moment with you and Dad. Write and tell us when the train will arrive in Toledo so we can meet you at the station. I can hardly wait. Love to you both, Henrietta. Grandma and Grandpa Holtz never made it to Toledo for Christmas. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, the whole country was put into a tailspin. Young men started signing up for the service as soon as the enlistment offices opened. Two of my father's brothers joined, and so did the young man who was going to take care of Grandpa Holtz's store. There was disappointment, of course, but it was offset by the terrible war news. No longer was the country sitting on the sidelines. It had been upgraded to first-string player. Dear Henrietta and Dick, I hope this finds you well and you got through the holidays all right. I'm glad you received our Christmas box in time. We had planned to bring the gifts with us when we came, of course. But I'm glad the mail was able to deliver them so Barbara could open our presents on Christmas Day, along with the ones from Santa Claus, of course. All this war business makes me sick. It looks as though we're going to have to dig deeper. We thought we were denying ourselves everything now. What will it be like if we have to do still more? Well, I've rambled on long enough, so I guess I'll close. It's late, and Dad's already in bed. Love, Mother. Grandma Holtz said that people would have to dig deeper, and they did. As the men went off to war, the women went to work. My mother got a job as a teacher in one of the nursery schools, which were started to care for the children of working mothers. It kept her busy, but it didn't stop her from worrying. My father had applied for a commission in the Navy and was waiting for an answer. It was only a matter of time, she thought, when she and I would be alone. So you say Dick hasn't heard anything yet? No, but he, he only sent the letter last week. I'm sure there's a lot of channels to go through before he gets an answer. All right, then if and when they call him, I have a suggestion. Why don't you come up to Marinette and stay with us while he's gone? Mother and I would love to have you. Oh, Dad, I couldn't impose on you like that. Vacations are one thing, but to stay for an indefinite time? The apartment behind the drugstore is so small. Oh, it's not that small. In any way for the summer months, you could stay out at Lake Nakwabi. I mean, I called Harry Conant this morning, and he said you could get one of his cottages for $100 for the whole season. That would be about 16 to $20 a month. Oh, Will, mm. tell her about the teaching job. Ah, yes. Mother just reminded me that you could probably get a job teaching in the fall. They're real short of teachers right now. And if you got a job teaching kindergarten, well, you could take Barbara right with you. Well, the cottage in the summer sounds good. 
and so does the teaching idea. But I couldn't stay in a cottage all winter. No, of course not. Then you could come back here. You and Barbara and Mother could sleep in the bedroom with a cot for Barbara. And I could sleep on the couch. It's plenty big enough. I found that bedding. Tell her I have plenty of sheets and blankets. She won't have to bring up a thing. Except clothes. <sighs> Mother says that you won't... I know. Uh... I heard her. Okay. It, it sounds wonderful. I appreciate the offer. Thank you. No need for thanks. It would be a treat for us to have you. I'll talk to Dick about it. And see what he says. You do that. But maybe we're jumping the gun. Maybe Dick won't be called at all. Maybe. And stop worrying. I can hear your brain buzzing over the line. <laughs> Is it that loud? <laughs> You're hurting my ears. Mm -hmm. Just remember, if you need us, the door is open any time you want to come through. Now tell Dick to get his fishing gear in order. If the Navy hasn't snagged him by this summer, why don't you come up here for vacation? I want to get Dick out at least once to go fishing. I have some new lures for him to try. New lures. Dad, he'd like that. If now, 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 no more ifs. Mother is with me right now, and we're both sending our love. Keep well and stop worrying. Things will work out. You'll see. As it turned out, my dad's number was never called. He used to joke that some poor Navy clerk must have misplaced it. Whatever the reason was, he never was drafted nor commissioned, and he served out the war at home. We did get to visit my grandparents, however, every summer during those early war years. Because gas was rationed, we took the train from Toledo to Marinette. Grandpa and my dad would go fishing, while Mother and Grandma and I picnicked and played on the shore. In 1943, however, the year I was five, I came down with the measles, and the vacation had to be canceled. Well, Mother and I did get to Wisconsin later in the summer, but my dad wasn't able to come then and we had to make the trip by ourselves. Grandpa missed having his fishing buddy, but his disappointment was eased in October when he received a surprise gift from my father. Dear Dick, received your gun and shells in good order. Thanks so much. You really took me by surprise. I guess Henrietta told you my old gun was out of commission. Never had much luck with it anyway. Maybe this one will change it for the good. I may not use more than half a box of shells this year, for I'll not shoot anything until I see the whites of their eyes first. At any rate, we'll try it out next weekend if the weather is nice. We sure enjoyed Henrietta and Barbara's visit. Wish you could have been here, too. Maybe next year, if God's willing. Love to all as ever. Dad. There never was another visit to Marinette, not to my grandparents' house at least, because they died that October, shortly after that last letter was sent. Inseparable in life, they were inseparable in death. They died on the same day within an hour of each other, my grandmother of a stroke, my grandfather of a heart attack. The last letter is a letter of sympathy from one of my mother's cousins. Dear Henrietta, I want to let you know that you have been much in our hearts and thoughts during these last few days. I wish that there were some way in which we could adequately express our deep sympathy, but I know that there is nothing we can say or do that can reduce the tremendous sense of loss that you must feel. Yet there is something beautiful as well as tragic in the thought that your mother and father should have gone from life together neither leaving the other behind in what would have been an unfulfilled and tragic life alone. But that doesn't reduce the shock that must have come to you in suffering so great a loss so soon. I share a large part of that sense of loss because of the happy recollections I shall always have of visiting all of you in those days when your home was a sort of second home to me. Mother told me over the phone on Sunday that you and Bill were both taking the situation bravely. Ellen joins me in all of this, 
Love, Ted. So, that's that. That's the last piece of correspondence. After my grandparents died, the cedar chest letters ended. Today, letter writing is different. We correspond through email and text messages and internet pages like Facebook. And while instantaneous messaging is nice, sitting here with the cedar chest letters around me, I feel a certain sadness. I wonder if by turning in our pens for computers, we haven't lost something rather special. Sometimes the pace today seems too fast to do much of anything but get out of each other's way. Hold on, hold on there, hold on. I'm sorry, sweetheart, but that's a whole lot of poppycock. I beg your pardon? I said that's a lot of poppycock. Baloney, doggy do, whatever you call it today. Don't make us out to be anything special just because we lived in the past. I, I wasn't. I mean, I, I don't think that we I We were the people of the times, and we lived with the tools of the times. Given a choice, I would have gladly thrown my pen away for one of your, um, uh, what's the name? Computers, great-grandma. Yes, computers. I could have written to your mother every day on one of those things and never run out of stamps. Oh, imagine asking a question and having it answered in a minute instead of a week. (laughs) Or a month. Try never. Okay. I understand. I get the point. Thank you. The point is, dear, people weren't much different in our day than they are now in yours. Your toys are much better, maybe, but otherwise we're much the same. Someone once said, and... I forgot who it was. Live today well, and tomorrow will take care of itself. Okay, okay, that's enough. You convinced me. The computer age is great, but once in a while, I like to still get out my paper and pens, and I know what I'm going to do tonight. What's that, dear? I'm going to write a letter. I'm going to write lots of letters, and hope somebody writes me back. This has been the Cedar Chest Letters, written and directed by Barbara Tyler. Starring in today's live broadcast were, as the narrator, Jane Myers, Nettie Boyden was played by Vicki Dumay, Jessica Holtz was Kathy Larson, Will Holtz, Brett Hodeck, and as Henrietta or Gurley Holtz, Jill Jensen. Special live sound effects were created by Barb Tyler. Our sound engineer was Chuck Janzer and chief radio engineer was Dave Janzer. Recorded sound effects were created by me. I'm Steve Brown. Support for the WGTD Radio Theater comes from the Kenosha Law Firm of Aaliyah Dumay and McTurnan and the Brown Ulster Performing Arts Foundation, located in the village of Salem Lakes. For the WGTD Radio Theater and the 91.1 Players, I'm Steve Brown, thanking you so much for listening to our live broadcast of the Cedar Chest Letters. This is WGTD HD, serving Kenosha, Racine, Elkhorn, and Lake Geneva, on your gateway to public radio.